for their future, uh, what does that look like and what do we mean when we talk about preparing students for their future? So that's, that's really what we're gonna be focused on today. And I think what you're going to find, and depending on what part of the reimagined training you went through, some of this might be new to you, some of this might be a repeat, uh, some of this hopefully is, is really the driving force behind what we were doing with Reimagine Washington Ed and where we are driving the future. Um, what we know is changing, and again, it's changing by the second of, of our understanding of education and what education is going to be in the future. Um, and so we just need to really make sure we're focused on preparing students for their future and not our past. And so that's, that's really what our focus is gonna be today. And I wanted to get us started by reading this, and I, I love this. This was actually, uh, this came out from Chris Reichdahl and OSPI last, whatever it was ago, two, last Thursday, I think, when they announced, or maybe it was two Thursdays ago, uh, now when they were talking about what does next school year look like? And I appreciate that Chris Reichdahl, uh, Superintendent of Public Construction here in the state of Washington, told us, said, please, let's take this opportunity over the next three months, not just to reopen schools, but to make changes we have wanted to make for years to make permanent practice those that were temporary responses. And I, I'll let you read this, but I, I love that OSPI is making a call out to us to say, what did we learn? What did we learn that we wanna take forward? What is it that are those changes we wanted and we knew needed to happen in our educational system that now maybe we're going to take a pause and we're going to look at? And I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, again, about an hour ago, I was on with a bunch of superintendents across our state and the questions they are asking, the things we were talking about is trying to reopen school and not focused on school, but focused on learning, which Tyler Rablin had a great tweet the other day that I shared with him about are the conversations at your school around reopening school or preparing for learning. And I just love that lens uh, as we, we continue to talk about what, what a future might be moving forward. And so we are in a time and space where, where we need to be thinking about different differently about, about learning. And so what I wanted to do and what I thought I would do is I would start off by just giving you a little background on kind of where we're headed. And, and for better or for worse, uh, part of this talk comes from a talk that I gave at a UN conference in Dubai in 2018, where we talked about, um, at, with the UN, the UN brought a bunch of thought leaders together, how my name got on the list, I, I still don't know, but brought a bunch of thought leaders together around this idea of the Knowledge Summit and what does it mean to move into a knowledge economy? And I think that's the first thing we have to understand. When we talk about preparing students for their future and not our past, we have to understand where we are and we have to understand where we're headed. And we have to be prepared to send students into what is right now being called the fourth industrial revolution, right? And this is the revolution that there's two big, two things I love about this graphic that, that we're looking at here. Number one, it's we are blurring the lines between the physical and the cyber divide and nothing has shown us more than going through this crisis together and looking at what the school is going to be like next school year. Whatever your school district decides, we are not going back to just being physical education. We're not, we're not going back to being fully online. What we want is we want both. We want great use of tech in face-to-face -face situations. We want to blur the lines between our physical and cyber learning landscapes. And I, there's been a couple uh, incredible articles that I've written lately that what this has done, what this crisis has done is almost leapfrog us maybe 10 years into the future. You think about things like touchless payment systems, whether it be Apple Pay or Google Pay or Venmo or PayPal, you think of what that is going to do, uh, what came out of this and what those companies are gonna be doing moving into the future. The other part of this graphic that I really like is the bottom little blue line down at the bottom where it says empowering corporations versus empowering people. And that's really what the fourth industrial revolution has been about is we are moving away from empowering corporations to empowering people. And we've seen that across this country. Before we went into this crisis, 30%, 30% of our economics driving force here in the US was from small businesses and independent consultants. We were on pace to be at 50% by 2025. That was before this crisis. What's it gonna be after this crisis? When anybody can work from home, when Facebook has already said, Google has already said, large corporations have already said, hey, you don't have to come back to work if you don't want to. What's that going to do? 
What does it do to empower people to know that you can start a business from home? You don't have to go anywhere. We're going to empower people. And when we talk about focusing on this generation, on preparing this generation for their future and not their past, are we empowering them to be their own leaders? Do we have entrepreneur programs in our high schools? Or do we have maker spaces that allow kids to invent things in our elementary schools? What are we doing to prepare a generation where you will be empowered because you have the connectivity of the internet at your fingertip? Now, when we talk about a knowledge economy, which is what that conference was focused on and is what we're going into, we were already there, especially as a state. Our state was already well ahead of the curve here in the US around being able to really be geared towards a knowledge economy. And the knowledge economy is an economy in which the growth is dependent on the quantity, quality, and accessibility of information rather than the means of production. That we are looking at, can we give every single person access to the quantity, quality, and accessibility to the world's information? That is what our growth is going to be dependent on which is why when I talked with the state legislators a couple of weeks ago, the number one question they are starting to ask themselves is should connection be a basic education? Should every kid having a device and internet connection be considered basic education in 2020? We're not, it's, not, it's not 1996 anymore. It's not 2007. The iPhone's been out for a while. In 2020 and beyond is being connected, part of basic education? I would say yes. And I'm so excited that our state is taking on large questions like this. That's not the only question they're looking at as we reimagine education across the state, but that is a critical one as we move forward into preparing students for their future and not our past. We've got to make sure that every kid is connected. Now, the other thing that goes with this is we have to understand that what this generation is being, uh, being tossed into, or what this generation is, is they are prosumers, and we're all prosumers. But this generation has grown up in a world where they have always been prosumers. Uh, if I, I'm 43, I, I've grown into becoming a prosumer, but this generation has always been prosumers. And a prosumer is a person who consumes and produces at the same time. It's a real word, you can look it up if you want. Um, but if you have a smartphone in your pocket, you are a prosumer. If you have a smartphone in your pocket, you are creating and consuming content at the same time. You will read an email and take a photo. And every time you take a photo, you created content. Every time you uploaded something to social media, you create content. Every time you send an email, you create content. And you expect to be able to create and consume at the same time, to produce something the moment you want to produce it whether that's a, a message to a friend or a family member. And so we have a generation that believes has grown up in a world where you should be able to consume and produce the moment you want to. And that becomes a critical skill. That becomes a lens that we must understand they view the world through. And so how are we changing our classrooms so that kids are prosumers? Would you say in your classroom, kids are prosumers, that they are consuming and producing products at the same time? That this idea of front-loading information might be an old way of thinking. How do we get kids to create and produce something the moment they learn it? And that hopefully is a theme that you hear come through this presentation. Now, one of the things we're moving, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things we are seeing changed and moving through and to me, this is the biggest change that we're going through right now is we are, for the first time, you know, I've said this quite a few times uh, over the last couple of weeks, but we are one of the last industries, education is one of the last industries to be disrupted by the internet. And it took a pandemic for us to be disrupted, but it, we are here. And we are finally having to face that we live or we're living in an out of date educational model. And that model, is what we call a just-in-case learning model. In a just-in-case learning model of education, we teach kids things just in case they need to use them in life. Right? And that's the way this model of education was set up. You have to remember that education, the way that we know education today, started in the early 1900s. And in the early 1900s, we didn't even have high school. That you went through eighth grade. Eighth grade education was as far as you went when we started this thing. And there wasn't even a public library system. 
So education's job, when we said education for all, education's job was to teach you everything just in case you needed to use it. So we created a system just in case you needed to use it. The reason why we set up uh, in high school when we decided on what science you take, do you realize they're in alphabetical order because nobody knew? So that's the reason why you take biology before chemistry is because B comes before C in the alphabet. It's the reason why physics is the last thing you take when in a lot of cases, maybe it should be the first thing you take. It, it, we were putting this thing together and, and there's little things like that that we are still doing today that I find fascinating. Um, but we have to understand that, that education, the way it was built, was built in a just-in-case model of education. But that's not the world that our kids live in. It's not the world any of us live in anymore. We do not live in a just-in-case model of education anymore. We live in a just-in-time model of learning. We learn things the moment we need to know it. And the thing I love about this is we were all thrown into the deep end to learn something new the moment we needed to learn it. Zoom had always been here. Zoom was not new. Zoom's been around. Skype's been around. Google Meets has been around for a long time. But we didn't have to learn how to use it until we needed it. Same with Google Classroom or Canvas or whatever you, you used as a home base. Right? But we live in a time period that the moment you needed to know that stuff, it was there for you. All you had to do was access that information. And here's how I know that outside of school, outside of school, the world works in a just-in-time learning model. Outside of the education itself, we learn just in time. Here's what I'd like you to do for me, please. Will you please, over in the chat, will you please tell me what is the last or what is something cool that you have learned by watching a YouTube video. Can you put in the chat, what is something cool you've learned by watching a YouTube video? So check this out. How to make a three bit, I missed that one, I went too fast. How to use my MacBook. How to make a mask. How to install a dishwasher how to put in a drip system in my yard, right? How to get a water stain of, off my dining room table, right? How to make a screen capture video, how to fix a swivel rocker, right? How to teach on Seesaw. And, and here's what I love, right? One of, one of the most, first of all, we need to understand that YouTube is the greatest educational platform ever created by mankind. So first and foremost, let's get it unblocked in schools. And there's a way to do it safely for every kid. And yes, that might mean that we have to teach kids not to watch cats riding around on Roombas, but you know what? The amount of stuff that you can learn on, on YouTube is incredible. And you are all proving it to me. And the other really cool part is you learned almost I'm going to guess everything that you put there, you learned it the moment you needed to know it. You don't go and learn about installing a dishwasher until you need to install a dishwasher. And that is the world we live in. We live in a just-in-time world. So are we teaching in a just-in-time model of education? Now, what does that look like? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, let's look at what just in case was. What are we moving away from? Here's what we're moving away from. We're moving away from understanding that we don't need to focus, nor should we be focusing on memorization as a learning skill, right? That in a just in case model of education, we needed you to know stuff just in case you needed to know it. And just in case you needed to know it, we wanted you to memorize it. So someday you might be able to use it. So we focused on memorization as learning. We believed, and for a long time, if you knew a lot of stuff, you were a knowledgeable person. If you knew a lot of stuff, you were a knowledgeable person. That's what we said knowledge was, knowing a lot of stuff, right? Because of that, because we focused on memorization as learning, we needed to be able to, fix, we needed to, be able to focus on fixed facts of knowledge. 
we needed to make sure there were things that we could tell you you could memorize that would never change. And so we focused on fixed facts of knowledge. And then we just had you repeat those facts over and over and over again. What we call now in education a spiraling curriculum, <laughs> right? We just keep building on top of it. But we don't, we just, we take this thing in it just in case you have to use all of this stuff in life. And then the third thing is we focused on repetition as the learning model. And we still do today in some cases, right? But you have to remember in the early 1900s, they believed the brain was a muscle. And because we believed the brain was a muscle, we knew if you work a muscle over and over again, the muscle gets stronger. Therefore, if you work the brain, which is a muscle, over and over again, it gets stronger. So we focused in on fixed facts of knowledge that you can memorize and you should memorize those by repeating them over and over and over and over and over again. And that is the educational system that we were still somehow using in various ways up until this latest pandemic. And all of a sudden this didn't work anymore because you knew a lot of stuff didn't help you. You had to learn the moment you needed to know something. And here's the crazy part. Our kids have never known this world. Our kids have only grown up in a just-in-time world. So what is it that we need to focus on in a just-in-time world? And I think you're going to see some of this. If you've been going through our Reimagine Washington Ed training, you're probably going to see some of this come through. First and foremost, we need to help students see and focus on connecting nodes of information sources. We need to support kids in understanding how to learn in an information overload world. How do I watch a video? read something on a website, go to Wikipedia, bring all of that stuff together and then make meaning of it. How do I consume and then produce something with that information? The moment I need it. That is knowledge. A knowledgeable person today is someone who can take in a wealth of information and create their own understanding, create value based on information coming at them. That is a knowledgeable person today. We need to focus on helping students understand the capacity to know more is more critical than what is currently known. And right now across this country, we are seeing this come to light. What this means is, do you have space to accept changing information in your life? Are we teaching kids that what you believe to be true today might not be true tomorrow because information changed? The half-life of knowledge right now, the half-life of knowledge, meaning half of what you believe to be true or believe to be false, changes every 18 months. Which means if you stop learning, you have a shelf life of three years. How do we help kids understand that what you know right now is your belief in this moment in time? But you have to be open you have to be open that the information landscape is changing. Can you get to a headspace that this is what I believe, but I might have to accept that something in my environment has changed? Or what we see a lot, especially the older you get, the less you're willing to accept new information. Instead, you look at all this information coming at you and you can't accept it. You're not willing to accept it, even though the data is sitting there in front of you. A great example of this. We were all taught in a just in case model of education that Pluto was a planet and it's no longer a planet. You were told that was a fixed fax of information that you could memorize that would never change, that would make you a knowledgeable person. And then someday that knowledge changed. Not only did that knowledge change, but then a few years later, after Pluto was no longer a planet, another piece of information changed. It's not blue. And still today, I love talking to adults who believe Pluto is blue because every single textbook that you ever saw Pluto was blue. Pluto's not blue. It's crimson and gray, go kooks. Right? It's a crimson and gray planet. It's not a blue planet. That, now, are you going to accept that? Are you going to accept that information that you believe to be true is somehow changed are you gonna believe me? Are you gonna go look it up for yourself? What are you gonna do with that information? Or are you just gonna outright say, no, that is not what I was taught. I was taught to believe, I was tested on it in second grade, and I believe Pluto is still a planet and it's still blue. But can you get to a place? And how are we teaching kids 
that, hey, information changes, man. This might be what you believe today, but can you accept that information around this is constantly changing? And the last part, how do we help kids focus on the ability to see connections between fields, ideas, and concepts as a core skill? How do we help students see that? How are we starting to think differently about education where we start to have interdisciplinary connections? We have teachers collaborating across subject areas or departments. Here's, here's a new class that I want. A new class that I want is I want a math art class, right? I want a math art class. Because if you go to this website, I'm gonna put it here in the chat, indeed.com, for those of you that don't know, is the number one job site here in the state of Washington, where yesterday when I was on it, or not, sorry, not yesterday, it's about four days ago now, three or four days ago, 54,000 job openings across the state of Washington. When you go there, you can put in state and you can type in something. If you wanna go there right now, here's, I'd love for the rest of my talk, go, go get lost in Indeed. If you go to indeed.com, go state of Washington, and then when you search, search for the word infographic. Now, infographic is where you take data out of a spreadsheet, math, and you have to artistically show us so that people can understand the data that you have found. How do you take data out of a spreadsheet and make it artistic, make an artistic representation of that data for people to understand? That is a new class of math and art combined. And if you do a search for infographic, the other day there were 707 jobs in our state where you needed to know how to make an infographic. And the starting salary on one of them was $96,000, knowing how art and math go together. Do a search for YouTube. Do a search for social media influencer. What are jobs, if you go to indeed.com, what is something you can search for that sounds like this crazy thing that kids are always talking about that you didn't even realize is a $100,000 a year job in this state right now? And then I'd even be looking at what education do you need to do to do that job? Indeed.com, every high school kid needs to know it and needs to know how to use it. But we have to be looking at how are we helping students see these connections between fields, ideas, concepts, what is the overlap of all of this? At the bottom of this, if you, have the, if you have the notes, if you have the slideshow, in the bottom left and right corner are two pieces of research that back this up. This isn't coming from me, this is research. In the bottom right-hand corner is the connectivism learning theory. There are 10 principles to the connectivism learning theory. These are three, and to me, these are probably the three most relevant. But the connectivism learning theory has been out since 2005. It's not new, it's been proven to work. It's a learning theory that, that we have taken on, that universities have taken on. And that, is, that has been the core of what has driven the work that we do. But I've put the link there to the connectivism learning theory if you wanna go dig into what are the other principles of the connectivism learning theory. And in the bottom left-hand corner is Becoming Relevant Again, which is a peer-reviewed paper that I wrote May of 2019 that talks about taking the 10 principles of the connectivism learning theory and putting them in practice in K-12 schools. So those are two pieces of research there, peer-reviewed research for you to take a look at, all right? Team, questions or comments from the chat, seeing that I can't see it? Or any ideas, thoughts that you guys wanna add? Is anybody listening to me at all? Am I here by myself? I'm, I'm with you, Jeff, but nothing's okay. coming up in the chat right okay. now. Awesome. You're doing a great job. Oh, thanks, Monica. Okay, well, we'll keep going then. If something comes up, we're gonna, we're gonna stop. We're gonna keep going here. You're blowing Brooke Ann's mind. Blowing All right, here. <laughs> it. I love it. So if we're going to move into a just-in-time learning world, we have to understand that what we're talking about here is we're talking about personalized learning. And that's where this whole thing is headed. We were headed there already. But what we have done is we have leapfrogged into the future where we're going to have the ability to be personalized learning, right? And this is the statement that I shared with superintendents across this state. Is the first thing we have to understand is you cannot pace personalized learning. That pacing guides are a 20th century idea of curriculum that do not 
transfer to a 21st classroom of best practice. They're not culturally responsive ways of teaching. Right? If we want culturally responsive ways of teaching, if we want best practice as it applies to 2020 and beyond, if we want to prepare kids for their future, not our past, we can't pace it. Which means that we all have a new job as educators. I was talking to a bunch of independent schools, uh, I don't know, two days ago now, three days ago now, and I love this. The question that came up, if kids can learn everything on YouTube, what value do we bring? And I'm thinking that is an amazing question every educator needs to ask themselves. If kids can learn your content by watching YouTube video, what value does education have? What value do educators have? And what value, if you're a private school that costs a lot of money, are you bringing to those kids? And if you can't answer that, we've got to dig deep. Because teachers matter more now than they ever have before, but they matter in a different way. Because kids can learn anything at the speed of a click. How are we teaching habits of learning? How are we teaching students how they learn best? How do we teach students how to access the best information so that they can consume and produce? How are we teaching kids different ways you can produce things? Not just through a five paragraph essay, but through YouTube videos, through infographics, through presentations. There's a lot of ways you produce stuff today. What does that look like? We need to focus on the standard-based grading approach, which is Tyler's last webinar last week about assessment right? and grading. We're going to have to think differently about this. We also have to understand that, and this you've been hearing this, if you've been going through the Reimagine Washington trainings, this isn't new to you, is that we have, to, we have to get kids to understand that failure is everything that happens right before you succeed, and fear is what holds us back. Fear is what is holding us back from really diving into looking at education. It was fear of maybe going the wrong step or, or wasting time down a, 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 the wrong path. The problem is, is that if, if we get stuck in fear, we never change. And what, what forced us, what, the pan, what this pandemic forced us to do was to real, we had to get over our fear really fast because we had to move. And we failed our ways to success. We failed our way to success. Because that is what learning is. Learning is failing your way to success. How do we get kids to understand that? How do we set up structures in our schools that get there? How do we set up grading policies that grade this? That's what we need. That's what our focus needs to be moving forward, right? How do we understand that we were all raised in a just-in-case time period? Our parents that we are trying to help and support as well were raised and went through school that focused on process and procedure. And you've heard this in different webinars. If you've, if you've come to our other webinars, you've heard parts of the team talk about this idea of highly structured, loosely organized, and that's where this comes from. We have to understand that brain research tells us that around the age of 23, and of course it's different for every person, but around the age of 23, the brain actually changes to the way it starts to learn. After the age of 23, the brain likes process and procedure. The brain loves things to be linear, you love to have a, a to-do manual. We just want to know where do you go and what do I follow and give me the steps. But before the age of roughly 23, that's not how the brain learns. The brain learns for children through a chaos and discovery. The brain learns by being put into a situation where there could be multiple different outcomes and I get to play. I get to discover for myself which is the right path. And I have a caring adult with me that is helping me figure out the processes and procedures that I need in order to make that discovery happen. That is how a child's brain works. The easiest example of this that I can think of is that if you've ever tried to, if you've ever witnessed or watched a kid learn how to walk, that is the human child brain at work. Because a kid, the only, the only concept that a child has that it is supposed to walk on two legs is watching other humans interact around it. And at some point, the child says, well, that looks like fun. I should try that too. And so it tries to stand up and it falls down. It stands up and falls down. They start to laugh as they discover how to walk, as they discover how to stand. And it's chaotic and it's not fun. And they stand up and they fall over and they laugh because they learn something. When a child learns to walk, 
they fail their way to success. And they stand up and they fall over, they stand up and fall over, and pretty soon they stop laughing and they start to get frustrated. And all of you parents can probably remember that frustration look on your child's face. And then all of a sudden the frustration turns to real frustration and they start to cry. And it's about at that point when they get really frustrated that a caring adult comes along and says, hey, let me give you a process and procedure to walking. Grab onto my fingers. And we do the, one of these back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we give them the process and procedure to learn how to walk. But only after they try and discover it for themselves. That's why you can't front load information. When we front load information for kids, we are taking the chaos and discovery out of it. When we tell kids, here is everything you need to learn on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, so you can go create something on Friday. PowerPoint, poster board, bubbles on the test. We've actually taken learning away from the child brain. So what we need to create is we need to create highly structured, loosely organized learning pathways. Highly structured, loosely organized learning pathways. That is what a choice board is. That is what the pathways that Jen and Shannon shared in their webinar are. That is what we talked about with, with and without walls. We talked about creating pathways. When we talked about project-based learning, we talked about creating pathways that allow kids to be in a mode of discovery and chaos with a caring adult that is supporting them with the processes and procedures the moment they need the process and procedure. Not before, the moment they need it. That there is a process to how you discover. Are we teaching kids the process of how you discover learning? It's called the inquiry cycle. Project-based learning, problem-based learning, challenge-based learning. There are cycles to discovery that we use in everyday life that we need to teach kids, here's how you discover things. And it's gonna be chaotic and messy and you're gonna fail your way to success, but we can get there and we're gonna set up a grading policy that rewards you for failing your way to success. Highly structured, loosely organized. Brain researched and approved. Now, as we talk about this generation, how are we helping them and supporting them and taking advantage of distance learning? Because there, there are so many things that, that I am so excited we were forced to do this. And I know that sounds bad, but we needed to make sure that we were preparing them for their future and not our past. And their future is changing rapidly. And I hope you're keeping up. Because on December 11th of 2019, research had just come out, right? So remember, this is like four months before we all closed school. Research had just come out to show that 35% of undergraduates in university and community colleges were taking at least one online class. 35%. We're, this is not your master's degree or your PhD, this is undergrads, which means we need to be graduating seniors knowing how to learn online. And if we weren't, we were not preparing them for college, career, or life. The military now has online courses for kids who are going into the military. After this pandemic, before this pandemic, but after this pandemic, almost every company that I have talked to has online onboarding programs. So that when you become a new employee, you're taking an online course to learn how to become an employee in that company. Are we preparing kids for a world that online learning is the new normal? Even when we go back to school, at some day in the future, we're all gonna be back in the same classroom, are we still preparing students for that future? Are we preparing students that while we were in the pandemic, the entire way you get into university changed? On May 26th, the University System of California dropped SAT and ACT requirements for all applicants. And as much as I hate to give kudos to the UW, on June 11th, the UW removed standardized testing requirements for incoming freshmen in 2021. No more SAT or ACT scores. And at the same time, reports are coming out from universities of what is going to take the place of 
the SAT and ACT. I put this down here at the bottom is the link to Inside Higher Ed. If you need to follow something about where everything's happening in higher ed, this is the place. The creation of a portfolio system of evaluation with scores trained to assess higher order thinking, communication skills, and the capacity of intelligent growth is the most promising approach to addressing persistent equity gaps and the growing economic and racial segregation in higher education. Kids are gonna need a portfolio. Finally, finally, we're getting to a place where the SAT is no longer, and what's going to replace it is a portfolio of work. So if we are preparing students for their future and not our past, are all of your seniors next year going to graduate with a portfolio? If you are a kindergarten teacher, are you starting to prepare kids to understand how they reflect on their work as they move through their learning journey? This isn't just about high school. We now have to create a system that doesn't teach kids how to take a bubble test, but teaches kids how do you build a portfolio system? How do you choose authentic work that identifies you the most, that can show your learning gains and reflects those in the assignments as part of your lived experience? I love that in relation to their lived experience. K-12 system, your kids need to have a portfolio and it needs to be the same portfolio. We are gonna start a portfolio in kindergarten and those students are gonna have the same, and I'm just using like Google Sites, Microsoft Sway, think of something web-based that these kids year after year after year get to build upon, get to change, get to put in new things, pull out old things. What would that look like so that we can prepare them for their future and not our past? Because here's where the portfolio is moving to. This, this lines exactly with, if you wanna to go to college, you're gonna need a portfolio. If you're gonna go into a career, you need a portfolio. And, and, and if you're going straight into a career, your portfolio is a, an amazing website called LinkedIn. And most educators don't understand this because we're like the only industry that doesn't use LinkedIn to get hired. But LinkedIn in 2018 was responsible for 94% of all hiring across America. 94% of people who got hired across America had some kind of LinkedIn connection. So if we are preparing kids for college and or career, right out of high school, you must understand how to make a portfolio and you must be able to put that portfolio into a website like LinkedIn. Because here's how you get hired today. If this is how you get hired today, period. Every industry that I have talked to, that I have supported, every business leader that I talk to says, here's how it works. We find you on LinkedIn. We then do a social media background check for you. Fourth grade teachers, are you supporting your, teach your students in setting up their first social media account. Middle school teachers, are you complaining about TikTok or teaching kids how to use TikTok? Because once they find you on LinkedIn, they're gonna search your social media. What does that say about you? That is part of your portfolio. Now they have enough information of who you are and what you do that they do a Google search for you. I am still shocked that when I work with high school kids, across the state, like 1% of them maybe actually Googles themselves. They don't even know what's out there about themselves. We've got to change that. We got to show these kids, you must be Googling yourself at least once a month. And what are you producing that when you Google yourself, you can be found? And then only after you have passed those three interviews, that's what those are, those are interviews. Only after you've passed three interviews that you didn't know was, that was going on behind the scenes, do they ask for your CV. And that is the only one that I know that we teach in school. And that of the four is the easiest. If anybody needs to know how to create a resume, here it is. You go file, new from template, pick the pretty one and fill in the blanks. The other three, that takes time and effort and knowing how systems work and understanding networks. Who you are attached to is power. Understanding nodes of information sources are also understanding nodes of people. LinkedIn is all about connecting people together.
That is how you get hired. Portfolios are the future. How is your school prepared for that? How are you supporting your students in creating portfolios that can be reflective, that can be added to over time? because their world changed on them. And all of those links that I just shared with you are less than a month old, less than a month, the entire system changed. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. How are we preparing them for their future, not our past? Yeah, Monica. There's a good question. And can you share your thoughts um, and recommendations on how to best serve students with significant cognitive disabilities in the shift to some of the things you're talking about, just in time learning and chaos and discovery and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, and, and of course, every, every student in every case is going to be different. And that's where this needs to become personalized for, for every kid. But I think there's a lot of, I, I think there's a lot of ways, again, that we can harness video for this. Um, you know, it, depending on what the disabilities are of the students, are there ways that you can communicate through video? Are there ways you can communicate through um, putting together digital stories? Is there ways you can communicate through audi auditorily? Um, I mean, there are tools out there to do this and those tools still fit in all of this. And I think that's the best answer I have right now is we have to understand what, what is it that that child needs and then what are the right tools that support preparing that student for college, career, and life, which is, what our, what, what is, which is our, our focus here in the state of Washington, OSPI said. That's, that's the best answer I have. Um, it doesn't have to be written, you know? And I think we have to get out of that mindset that everything has to be written. Let's get into a mindset of there's video, there's audio, there's digital storytelling for some kids. Um, I mean, you can still make something out of a poster. You can still cut things out of paper and take a photo of it, right? Remember, the most, I don't even have my phone with me. The most powerful piece of technology we have is the cell phone. It has two cameras on it and an re audio recording device and a video recording device. All you need is a phone. You need a phone and you can make this work. Yeah. Now let's talk about some of those things we need to prepare kids for as well. And one of the things is that I like to just make sure that we touch on is this idea of YouTube because they are a YouTube generation. They are a media first generation. You've probably heard us be talking about that through the reimagined trainings. We're, we're dealing with a media first generation. We're dealing with a generation that regardless of social economic status, the average child in, in America touches a connected device for the first time at age two. And what we are hearing from more than, more than anything from teachers is that when kids grow up, they say, I wanna be a YouTuber. And why wouldn't you wanna be a YouTuber, by the way? Right? Especially when the number one YouTuber last year made $27 million being a YouTuber. $27 million being a YouTuber. He was nine, by the way. He's Ryan's toy reviews. I'm sure somebody who has a young child probably knows Ryan pretty well. He has his own line of toys now at Walmart, I guess. Right? But we have to understand that, that this is a media first generation. It's also the reason why instructional videos work, but instructional videos don't just work because they are a media first generation. It's because you all told me just a little while ago, you learned stuff through instructional videos too. They're just how to fix your dishwasher or how to make a mask or how to change the light, uh, the headlight on a car. You all learn through instructional videos too, because they work three to five minutes. Most of them are one takes, somebody walking you through something you need to learn the moment you need to learn it. It's just what a good instruction is. But here's the other side of YouTube that I think we have to remember, that the number one complaint that I get from both parents and teachers about kids on YouTube is that all they do is they sit around watching other people play video games. And, and I, I love when this comes up with parents. And, and if, if, if you have parents that you need to point this out to, please do. That they are not the first generation to sit around and watch other people play games. The game is different. 
The screen is different, but humans have been sitting around watching other humans play games as far back as we can remember. On Sundays, this entire country shuts down to watch other people play a game. Right? But here's the difference. When students watch other kids play video games, they're actually getting better at playing the video game. They want to know what is the hack? What is the secret? What's the tip or the trick to get to the next level? I, when I watched Wheel of Fortune, I was never trying to get better at Wheel of Fortune. I was watching it for pure entertainment. When I watch the Seahawks on Sunday, I don't watch it thinking, you know what, someday I'm going to be Russell Wilson. No. I watch it for entertainment. These kids don't. And here's the best part. When these kids actually subscribe to a YouTuber's channel, they are following a mentor. As we went through the reimagined trainings, you might remember at the end, we asked you, how do you learn? And one of the ways that people learn is through finding mentors. And when kids subscribe to the channel of a YouTube influencer, they have found a mentor. So how are we teaching kids what is a good mentor? Are we teaching kids what to look for in a good mentor? What should a good mentor, how should they talk to you? How should they support you? Because that is a way that we learn is by having mentors, surrounding ourselves with people. Right? And if you want to be a YouTuber, go be a YouTuber. Go to indeed.com, type in YouTube and see what the starting salary is and the education that you need in order to run YouTube for a company. And there's all plenty of jobs waiting for it. The education isn't usually a four-year degree, but you need to know how YouTube works. You need to know how to read analytics. There's your math. You need to know how to write a good description. There's your English class. You need to know how to write a, a, a speech or you need to know how to write a script or follow a script. There's English class. How do you tell a story? There's English class. Right? How do you bring in a historical perspective to what you're trying to tell people? There's history. Of course you want to be a YouTuber. Who wouldn't want to be? Because what we have to understand is we have to get away from this idea of screen time is the same for everybody. And I can't remember who said it. Um, I think it was Jen. I think Jen said it in her webinar and it's been in the back of my mind that we have to stop seeing screen time as like this all encompassing screen time. All right. That there are, there are multiple, when we, when we say screen time, there's a, a whole pre, there's, it's a whole spectrum of what you're doing on the screen. One of my favorites is I was just talking with the school, uh, I think yesterday, and the school has parents who want their kid to be on a Zoom for seven hours a day. They want their kid to go to school on Zoom. And I'm like, these are the same parents who were just months ago saying, my kid's on the screen too much. I don't want, my kid's never allowed on the screen. I don't want my kid on the computer. I don't want my kid on the computer. Now all of a sudden they want their kid on the computer for seven hours a day. Nothing's changed. It's not about being on the computer. It's about understanding what they're doing on a computer. So when we have students on computers, how much are they creating versus how much are they consuming? I want every teacher to reflect. I want every teacher to reflect on when you have students using technology in your classroom, are they consuming or are they creating with technology? That is a great lens to look at our computer time. Because if kids are consuming, that's fine. We have to consume. But what are you doing with that consumption? If you're not taking that and instantly creating something with it, I would say it's a bad consumption. Here's an example. IXL. I can consume through IXL, but there's no way for me to take that consumption and instantly create something with it. iReady. I can consume through iReady, but there's no way for me to take that and create something with it in the moment. It's just consumption. And you can probably tell how I feel about those programs. The world belongs to those that create, not those that consume. On and off a computer. How are we setting up situations that are chaos and discovery where kids have to create something to prove they know it? That's the future. 
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see the chat here and answer your questions as we start to wind this down. Um, well, sorry, I will still share my screen, but I'm going to get it out of full. See if I can get it out of full screen mode. There we go. What do we have left here? We've got like five minutes left. Ooh, yeah, seven minutes left. And I'm going to be able to open up the chat now and look at some of your questions. Are there any questions or comments from the panel? Is there anything you guys want me to hit on or questions coming up? Cool. So here's what I'd like you to do in the chat. As we wind down this school year, I'd like you on the screen here. I just uh, doing a quick stoplight activity to kind of wrap this up. Um, what do we need to consider stop doing in schools? I mean, think about what we just went through. What worked? What didn't work? Where, where, where are we headed in the future? And maybe jot down on a piece of paper. How do we get paper. admin on board? That's the next question. How do we get admin on board? How do we get admin on board? Yeah. Well, we have to, we have to support them because they are, they are thinking through these things too um, at, at all levels. We are thinking through a lot of stuff at all levels. Right? Yeah, stop yelling at kids about phones. That'd be a good thing to stop. Well, um, what do we need to consider continuing? What were we doing well? Yeah, and, and a lot of uh, school administrators that, I was, that I've been talking to, when I do this same activity, the same stoplight activity with administrators, the one thing they want to continue on is a continual focus on equity, which I think is fantastic. We need to continue on that, use that as a lens. Absolutely, 100%. Right? But what are some things we need to continue doing? And then what do we need to consider starting? What are some things we need to consider start doing on behalf of our kids? If we are truly gonna prepare kids for their future and not our past, what are the things we need to start doing in education? So what are the things we need to stop doing? What are the things we need to continue, continue, consider continue doing? And what do we need to consider start doing? And I think this is the perfect time of year to start thinking about those things. Jeff, one thing came up that said, how, do, how about parents and caregivers? How do we offer support for them about this? Yeah, that's a really great question. And that right there is the reason why education is so hard to change. And I know as educators, we're in it every single day. And the hardest, the, the reason why this is the hardest industry to work in is because every single person went through it. Every single person goes through it at some level. And let's be honest, if we're truly being honest, it works for most of us. It doesn't work for all, but it works for most. So when we end up in a crisis, you have an entire country of, of people who went through an education system and they just want, they just, they only know the education that they know. And the education they know is a just in case educational body that, uh, educational, just in case educational model that worked for them or it worked kind of for them, or it didn't work for them, but it's the only model they know. And so we have to retrain parents on what is good teaching and learning in a just-in-time world, which means we're going to have to take some time, both with teachers, are you making videos that actually explain the learning you're having kids do and why it's good learning? We're gonna to have to make those, especially as we start thinking next year. You're gonna be you're gonna be making instructional videos for your kids, and then not all the time, but maybe you're starting a new unit, and you're gonna be like, "Hey, parents, I just wanted to send you a quick video and tell you our thinking and reasoning for setting up this structure this way." Okay. And I think we need to help them make that make that shift. No, here at Shifting Schools and part of the Reimagine program that we're running. We are creating uh, modules for parents as well for you to use. They will be free for any parent around the world can use them. But one of the first modules that we're making, I've got my list here that the team and I, uh, sorry, you can't actually see it, the list that we kind of looked through. But one of the first modules we're making is best practices for online and why struggle is good for learning, right? It's a couple of them. So we need, to, we, we need to support parents because they, they were caught off guard like everyone else. And they don't, they just, they know worksheets and they know lecture. You are supposed to go to school, sit your rear end in a seat for one hour, get up and go to another. Or in elementary school, you're supposed to go, 
sing songs, have fun, right? That's what they remember. And so we're, we, we're changing an entire industry and it's going to be tough and it's, it's going to take some time. It doesn't happen overnight. I think with parents right now, we have to make sure that we're approaching the fall in a positive light and letting our parents know that it's going to be okay, whether we're in person or we're online, because our kids are hearing. And if our parents and if our teachers and if our district are saying fall is going to be horrible and terrible and it's not going to work and masks aren't, kids are, are picking up on that and kids are being saying it's not going to work because I'm not going to learn. And we've got to turn that tide so that we approach the fall in a positive in a positive light, no matter yeah. what, no matter where we are, it's going to be okay. And our kids are going to or learn what the situation of your and school it's is just yeah. good teaching. Yeah. yeah. A couple other things I wanted to share with you as we wrap this up and then I will stay on for a little while. If anybody else has any questions or comments, we can chat. Um, but I also wanted to share with you a, a couple of resources. So after the stoplight, if you have, and I'll, I'll put the link back into the, the slides here and it'll be up with the recording as well. Uh, but this is a great video by a, 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 uh, another teacher named Carl Fish out of um, Colorado. He made this in 2006 and the, the name of the video is What If? And it goes through the history of things at his high school um, around things that didn't, that things that people were pushing back on, whether it be parents or teachers or admin, uh, things like using calculators in the classroom. And now all of a sudden we require every kid to buy a calculator, you know, things like that. But it's a really interesting kind of look at the history of things that have been pushed back on and where we are today. And with that, I think it's kind of fun uh, as, an, as an educator to be thinking in terms of what if, right? In terms of what if there was no bell schedule? How would we schedule learning? What if I only get to see my kids every other week? How am I best going to use that time? That's a great what if, right? What if there was no pacing guides? What could personalized learning look like in my classroom? What if I allowed students multiple attempts at showing me they've mastered a standard? What if I tried project-based learning where kids were in chaos and discovery mode? What if I adopted the inquiry cycle and actually had kids work through solving their pro problem? What if, right? And, and throw them out there. This is, we have opportunity right now like we've never had we have opportunity to try stuff and people will forgive you it doesn't work so try stuff try things new i my my biggest hope right now is that teachers are going into school and they're emptying the filing cabinets into the recycle bin and they never come back what if right what if I also wanted to share with you um, if you're part of the reimagine ed program you know we've been working on reimagine 2.0 we are still in the process of outlining those. Uh, we are planning on running the Reimagine 1.0, which you can see there, where there'll be eight sessions. Uh, if you already took Reimagine 1.0 and you were wondering what Reimagine 2.0 is going to look like, these aren't set in stone yet, um, but kind of are thinking through right now what they're going to be. Kind of this idea of creating pathways, which we started talking about, uh, that builds on a, a lot of the work that um, Jen and Shannon and Steve and Stefan, this idea of building pathways for students in and outside the walls, the power of wayfinding. We use wayfinders in our classroom. How do we make sure we're using wayfindings on the internet? Um, teaching through the inquiry cycle. How do we make sure we assess the process of learning? Uh, setting up our grade book for mastery learning with Tyler. Um, if you watch Tyler's webinar, please go back and watch that. That's a big, big part of this. And then we're going to start helping us to create your, how do you create your learning system uh, as we get ready for school to start? And then the last session will be reflect in preparation for a new year and what that looks like. If you'd like to stay informed, uh, you can sign up here. Uh, if you click here to sign up, if, again, I'll throw this over here. Uh, that is our new newsletter that we finally got set up. You can uh, put your email address in there. It's at the end of the slideshow. There's the slideshow again for you. Um, uh, do I have the link to Tyler's webinar? Yes, it's over on the Reimagine Wa Ed website under the resource page. I can send that to you right now. Uh, that's where all the webinars are, actually. If you missed any of the webinars, you can come over here to the Reimagine page, and I will put that for you here in the chat. And you can, there you go. 
they are there for you along with the slide deck. This one will be there as well. If you give me, please give me uh, 24 hours or so. This will be there as well. Um, just a place um, for you to go. Yeah, to sign up for 2.0, if you, if you fill out the link on the end of the slide deck, that'll make sure that you're on the list. But if you, if you already took Reimagine 1.0, you will be notified when Reimagine 2.0 signups come out. Um, we will be here to support you through that uh, as we continue to move forward. So um, thank you for joining me for our last webinar series before August. Um, I will hang out for a few more minutes if there are other questions. Otherwise, thank you for spending your Wednesday afternoon with me. I really appreciate it um, and hope to see you in the future somewhere along the way. So thank you so much. Hmm. When does this get into TPEP, I wonder? That's a good question. I like that. I think it's coming soon. I think, I think we're seeing a lot of things change for sure. Great. Anything from the panelists? Anything anybody else wants to add? I, I love that comment about when does it get into TPEP because yeah. You know, so so many parts of TPEP are around how are we giving students ownership over the process, and the language might be different, but I think it's you know it probably does need to be changed or updated. But you know, the, even in a world where maybe people aren't thinking about how YouTube could be used or how tech is being used, everyone understands there's power in giving students resources and letting them go their own way with it. So you know, yeah. is the language there? No that still needs to be probably updated, sure. but yeah. are the ideas there? I, I think they're in there. And so we can, you know, if, if we need justification, if someone questions, why are you doing it that way? You know, I think we can even point to that and say, well, cause I'm supposed to, right? Like, cause that's how I'm being evaluated. That's already in there. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of things, right? Like our state is really, is really pushing UDL design now, right? Universal design for learning, uh, which, which, which incorporates, um, you know, culturally, re, uh, culturally responsive learning. It's exactly what our pathways are. Um, and so it's been so interesting. I've been explaining this idea of pathways and the first thing almost every uh, administrator says, is like, oh, that's, U that, that's like UDL. And I'm like, yes, this is what we know to be true. And so you're right, Tyler. I think there's a lot of things that the state has really started to, to put that lens on that TPEP is going to have to update because OSPI is, 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 is making a lens that, you know, is putting a focus there as well. So um, I think that's gonna have to update for sure at some point. Um, yeah, what about teacher prep programs? I'm working with a couple of them, but they have to be updated as well. And I talked about that with the state legislators uh, and the education committee. I talked about our pre-service programs and how one tech credit <laughs> is not what we need for teachers when, you know, after this, we're looking at 100% of our school districts almost one to one. Not all, but we are getting awful close. So we better understand. We better be preparing teachers, especially if we're an education state. We produce, you know, we're one of the top states in producing teachers because we got so many teacher programs in the state, which is awesome. But we got to make sure that we're staying we're staying ahead of that curve. Make sure that control. We just had a tech teacher leave and. Mm people applying for the job are asking, well, what does this job consist of? And I just kind of took a big step back and go said, good question. What will it look like in the fall as a tech class? Um, I know you have lots of opinions about that, but what yeah. it's been passed as a tech class one period a day is not what it is anymore. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. Thank you, Brooke Ann, for that. I'll throw that out that she threw out that ERWC. I'll have to look into that. That's good. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. I'm out of here. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Appreciate you hanging around for a few minutes. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, awesome. Just some really good stuff going around. I really appreciate it. Um, what should we focus on for the summer? Oh, what a great mm -hmm. question. Focus for the summer. Um, so a couple things that I would focus on, I'm just trying to think through this because it's going to be things I'm focusing on too. I'm going to be focusing in on really getting really good at making instructional videos because I, no matter, no matter what, what the future holds, knowing how to make a good instructional video. So, and, and all is it's going to be is like when I go to YouTube and 
for many of you know, but we're in the middle of renovating our, our house, which is why I'm at my sister-in-law's place up in Bellingham, not in Seattle. Um, and I, I just think that every time I watch a YouTube video, I want to dissect it on why did I choose that video? Why did that video work or not work? And I just want to be thinking through that. I mean, I, I don't need to be creating videos per se all summer long, but anytime you're watching an instructional video, which we probably will continue because it's just we, that's how we learn. I just, just give it a quick reflection. Why did I pick that video? Did that video work? What was it about that video that worked or what was it about that video that didn't work? And already I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, my first week back with my kids where they're in front of me, that is what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to go through and watch videos and say, why'd you choose that video? Did it work or didn't it work? Why did it or didn't it work? How would you make it better? I think that'd be a great, like, we got to help kids learn, learn how to learn, right? So I think that'd be something this summer that I would focus on. Um, get to know your home base. That would be my other thing. Like if, you're, if your school district has adopted Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams or Schoology, um, I would really, I, Canvas, whatever, whatever your district has, has adopted, I would focus this summer on, on really getting good at that. You know, really dig in, see what it can do. Um, again, watch a ton of YouTube videos around them. All of those, all of those learning management systems, all those home bases, oh, there's tons of videos out there. Um, and, and don't just do like, you know, Canvas in the elementary classroom. Do math, sixth grade math teacher Canvas, because the video probably exists and you'll get to see exactly how other teachers structured it. So that would probably be my two things I'd focus on, making good instructional videos and um, getting really good at my home base. How about anybody I, else? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff I would say, I, I, would agree with, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, I think additionally what I would say is really focusing lessons, especially early on, on things that could work no matter what the model is. So yeah. in other words, you know, again, going back to our, our webinar that Stefan and I did, but with and without walls, just really thinking about whatever learning opportunities you put together, yeah. ask yourself as you put it together, would that work if we were brick and mortar? Would it work if we were fully online? Would that work in a blended? I mean, then, then you're ready to go regardless of what that model is, because like the, as, as much as we wanna know what the model yeah. is gonna be, this whole virus is changing week to week. Yeah. So it, it, we don't know what it's going to be in September. So to be yeah. ready for that. And then I think the additional piece to that is when you put it together, come up with a, uh, an organizational structure, I guess, or a wayfinding aspect of how you're going to present that learning that's yeah. efficient for you to do is easy for students to understand and that you're going to consistently use for all your learning opportunities. Yeah. And I think the, the, the main word there, Steve, I agree 100%. Um, and I think consistency, right? We've got to find a, we've got to find a way that is consistent regardless of what situation we find ourselves in. And that's that wayfinding, right? How are you setting up a system? And once you, once you have a system and it doesn't mean you can't make little adjustments because the system's not going to be perfect. It's the first time you've ever done this, but how do we make little adjustments within that system? Um, you know, as we continue to go along, anyone else, what would you focus on or what are you going to focus on this summer? I think that's good. I had a friend and I love this idea. They said, I make, basically they said, I'm making a list of everything I'm nervous about for the fall. Mm. And then, you know, cause a lot of them are like, how am I going to build connections with kids? And so like, that's on their list. And right now, because they don't have a strategy, it's the scary part of what's right. coming up. And so they right. said, I'm just going to make a list of all the things that I'm nervous about. And then I'm going to spend like my cup of coffee in the morning, just yep. getting ideas right? Knowing that there's a solution out there. So even if you don't necessarily learn it, like starting now to resolve some of those fears and see, oh, this is a tool I will, I'll need to learn and just kind of getting that started and getting the ball rolling. So it's less of a, a, a daunting task to look yeah. at. Um, I like that. I was going to say, uh, along with what Steve said, that I've been telling cohorts, focus on things that will work both within your walls and without your without walls so that you can easily go between whatever model wherever you are teaching and that you don't have to be multiple personality we know mm. that what we've learned distance teaching is good teaching we can use that in our classrooms we can use it in our virtual worlds but create systems that work both places so that you are not creating double the work yeah and i think i mean i think that is the the best um strategy because we all know it's going to take one person to test positive in the school 
and we're shut down for 14 days, right? So you're, you're going to have to make sure that you create something that can be used in both spaces because uh, my feeling is, is at least for the first semester, probably longer, but we're going to be in a, a constant flux. I mean, I look at South Korea as a, as a good example. If anybody's been following what's going on in South Korea, I mean, they had one high school that was back in session for three days, a student tested positive, and they were out again for two weeks. And then they came back, they were back in session for a week, a uh, teacher tested positive, they've been out for four, like they've actually only been back in school four days, even though they've tried over the last four weeks of the school year. Um, and that's just gonna be the way it is, right? So, um, cool. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you team for being here and supporting, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me this evening. I will let you all go, uh, really appreciate it. Again, this will be up on the, on the website shortly. Uh, we'll make sure it goes out to the mailing list as well. Thanks everyone. And until next time, I'll see you on the network. Thanks. See ya.